Hi, I'm Elliot Margulies. I'm from the MidPen Media Center located in Palo Alto, California. And as we record this Zoom program, which is called Exchanges, uh, it's Teacher Appreciation Week, and it's May 7th. I don't know if, if the teachers gathered here today uh, knew about Appreciation Week because they've been working double, double hard, double, double duty, and need double, double appreciation for changing everything from top to bottom. Probably in mid-March, uh, you went to the virtual classroom. And while some of you may have done some things online before, your whole teaching lives is now online. And we wanna hear about that on our exchange today. I just wanna say, while everyone around here knows about our students uh, going online and trying to learn from home, maybe not everybody knows how many students this, this involves. I went online and saw that UNESCO said that 188 countries have closed their schools nationwide. And that involves over a billion and a half uh, students who are closed out of their schoolrooms. So it's, um, it's a new world, at least temporarily, and we wanna hear about your experiences. So uh, before we get started with some questions, let's have each of you introduce yourself uh, and the subject you teach and the school that you teach from. And I'll just say your first name so that you're not all jumping in at once. So Stacy. My name is Stacy Arevalo and I teach English at Eastside College Preparatory School in East Palo Alto. I teach 10th grade American literature and a 12th grade class called Senior Research Institute. Thank you. And Paul Dunlap. Hi, my name is Paul Dun Dunlap and I teach at Henry M. Gunn High School in Palo Alto. I teach a Shakespeare elective class for juniors and seniors, a freshman and sophomore core class, and the senior AP literature class. And uh, Manny? Um, hi, I'm Manny Martinez. I teach at Leadership High School in San Francisco. I teach 11th grade English and AP English, and I teach um, sociology to 12th graders. Great, and uh, Margarita. Hey, so I'm Margarita Mendez, and I teach at Ellen Fletcher Middle School in Palo Alto. I teach um, eighth grade Spanish 1B, which is high school second semester. And um, I also teach seventh and eighth graders in the AVID class. Thank you, and Paul McHenry. Hi, my name is Paul McHenry. I teach at Mountain View High School in Mountain View, California. Um, I teach AP Psychology to juniors and seniors, and then College Prep US History to juniors. And uh, Mary Ann. I'm Mary Ann Kokenderfer. I teach sixth, seventh, and eighth grade music at Ravenswood Middle School in East Palo Alto. And maybe we can get a song out of us later. <laughs> uh, I think we'll be ready for some singing at some point. And uh, lastly, Julio. Hello everyone, my name is Julio Navarrete. I teach Spanish at American High School in Fremont. I teach Spanish three and AP Spanish language and culture. Thank you all for joining. This, this really happened almost overnight. I mean, I can remember one day it was, we're not gonna shake hands anymore. We're gonna bump with our elbows and then a couple days later, we are with um, sheltering in place from our homes. But for you, that meant creating a whole, uh, a whole curriculum, a whole classroom online. But before that point, let's go back to when you had to exit and vacate your classroom. Anything that uh, went through your mind at the time, mm, what should I take home with me? Uh, so I'll... I'll start with uh, Paul McHenry. What did you take? So I, I was expecting to come back. So the last thing we had been told was we're going to be out for a couple of weeks. 
we're going to move spring break um, and then we'll be back in a couple of weeks. And so I, I left my stuff behind, right? I, I had to actually get special permission to go in and get my mask and gloves to get student papers to grade and then uh, picked up a bunch of books because that's, I think, the resource that I didn't have at home that was probably most useful for me in terms of the psychology stuff, especially um, reference works that I have in my classroom. And anything green? Oh, yeah, I, I brought my plants home, too. Um, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was a little bit worried about them. Yeah, they'd probably be dead by the time you get back. Yeah. So good decision. Uh, Manny, what did you pack? Um, well, it was kind of ominous, actually, because the, I think the last thing that the, the, the last exchange that I had with my kids, we all kind of like agreed that we didn't know if we were going to see each other again. Like we've, you know, so I grabbed a box full uh, of books, um, just as Paul did. I knew that that was going to happen. I even took a poster off my wall. Um, what was it? Um, the uh, Carlos, uh, the 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 guys from the Olympics. Uh, Olympics, yeah, at San Jose State, um, from San Jose State, um, and my computer and an extension cord because I knew I was going to need that as well. For us in Fremont, it happened uh, very quickly. We there was no information about whether our school would close or not up until uh, Thursday night, March twelfth. We received an email saying that we. Um, might not be coming back on Monday. Uh, so on Friday, we all went through the day telling our students to bring their materials home, uh, but not being able to tell them uh, specifically if we would come back or not. We all left for the weekend and still didn't know whether we would be back on Monday. So it was, it was a really awkward experience um, to say to my students, I might see you on Monday, have a good weekend. Um, but I, uh, similar to what everyone else has mentioned, I, I packed books that I would need for planning, my computer, um, but I also brought my coffee mug. This is a coffee mug that my mother-in-law had given me, and I wasn't sure uh, how long we would be out of the classroom if we were, so I decided to bring that with me so that I can keep drinking coffee from it <laughs> at uh, home. Does it say something on it? Um, it does. It says the ties between us are very special. Oh, I'm glad you brought that home. Um, so all of a sudden you become, uh, I, I don't know if you're all using the same platform, but you become these online um, technicians in addition to teachers. So how, how did you learn so rapidly <laughs> to set this uh, alternative universe up? Uh, what, what instructions, what help, uh, how, did it, how did you do it? I'm a music teacher and our school actually did not close until we were shut down on March 17th. And we found out after school was over, which meant like everybody was home for the day. Um, I had kind of suspected at that point that we'd eventually get shut down. So I grabbed some things, but the students were being told to come back and none of my students had instruments. So it's already hard to teach an instrumental class online, but my students only had their, they suddenly had no instruments. So I had to basically shelf my curriculum for the rest of the year and start over with something completely new. Um, I had my seventh and eighth graders in Google Classroom, but the sixth graders I didn't, and I'm still to this day missing three of them and nobody knows where those three are, which is concerning. But. Wow. Okay, uh, Manny, did you, uh, you, can you share a little bit about setting up your new reality, virtual reality? Um, it was, it was interesting at first because, I mean, I, I wasn't sure whether we were going to get together through Zoom or anything like that. So the first thing that I did was record a few videos and, um, and then send them out to the, um, uh, the entire like, junior class and, and my sociology class. Um, and I did that for the first two weeks um, until we kind of, and until everything kind of like shifted and we understood how we were gonna get together and office hours were put, you know, were, 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 were put out there as far as like when they would um, log in. But the first couple of weeks was just me recording myself I bought a little whiteboard for the room 
you know, and, um, and I did it like that. Are these like uh, 50 minute lectures that you're recording or what? Um, yeah, and, and not even 15 minutes to, tell, to be completely honest, um, Elliot, like um, maybe 10. Oh. 10 minutes uh, and and some of it was me like um going through some of the instructions that they had that i that they had through email um of graphic organizers and stuff going through them um and um putting on the board ex like bullet points as far as instructions or whatever and or or an example of what their culminating um assignment should look like and stuff like that so Marianne brought up something interesting. She still has three kids missing. Uh, Julio mentioned that the kids didn't even know, the students didn't know on the, the last day that it was their last day. Um, if anybody wants to answer the previous question about getting set up, please do so. But add in, how did you get your students to show up? We did lots of calling to parents to the point where I think the parents were tired of the phone calls, but um, we did manage to get most of the kids online that way. We've also sent postcards and emails and text messages. So it takes a lot of, um, it takes a lot of effort. And then also in our school, it took a long time to get everybody uh, set up with computers and internet. And we would think we had a problem solved and then something would happen. So that we're kind of back at square one and these kids didn't have the tools they needed to do school. So I teach at an independent school, a private school. Um, we ended up closing down on March 12th. March 12th was our last day. We don't need to follow the county guidelines. Um, so um, in the days leading up to it, about a week before, we teachers were told to get ready if we were to shift online so that we ordered all the books we needed. We made copies of packets. Um, our IT person started inventorying the Chromebooks that we had at our school already and identifying which families would need to borrow some. Um, our vice principal was calling families and helping them get internet if they didn't have it. Um, we ended up buying a bunch of Chromebooks that have, I guess, mobile connectivity. So for, we have a few students who live out in the Central Valley and normally dorm at our school. So they don't have strong internet options where they live. Um, so there was a big effort just to make sure that before students left that they'd have what they needed. But even then the technology fails and we've had to drive things out to different places um, to get them set up. Um, but I would agree that the technology gap was the, the biggest hurdle. Um, again, I teach at a private school, so we were able to shift resources really quickly. Um, but it's something that continues to be pretty rough. Um, all my students are enrolled in my Google classes, but if they don't show up, it's usually because of some unforeseen technology issue. So we try to troubleshoot that as it comes up. Palo Alto, which has, I think, about 12,000 students, um, uh, that Friday, the students found out at lunchtime, and we found out at lunchtime as well. Um, and then we told the students six period, which is the period following lunch. And then on Monday was a work day for teachers in Palo Alto. And on that day, um, the school did shift and we handed out a bunch of Chromebooks, which is at the middle school, not the way we operate. The high school is different. The kids are one-to-one -one there, but that's not the case at the middle school. And so we made sure that all of the kids had a device and the district somehow, I'm not sure how, uh, also got hotspots for those families. Um, we're doing asynchronous learning um, and there's synchronous components, but the learning is primarily asynchronous. And so- So just, just give a definition of asynchronous, how it, what, what's an example? So like we're not doing live classes. I know Eastside is doing live classes. Um, my son goes to a private school, they do live classes. So there's a certain time and you show up and you go to class. Um, we're not doing that. Um, we do have Zoom meetings, which for me, like it doesn't count against the students who don't show up. Um, and like the kids who come definitely take away something that will help them through their week. I try to record them, but obviously sometimes I run into issues like we did here at the beginning, um, and, or I think I recorded it and I didn't. Um, and so, and so that's a, so asynchronous students log on on their own pace and they, they um, get the instruction at a time that's convenient for them. And most high schoolers and middle schoolers are waking up much later. Um, and so they're, they're doing it on their schedule, not at a schedule that we're dictating like our zoom 
meetings are at a certain time and um, but students can choose to come and a lot of them do choose to come and it's really great to see them and I know we have a question about that first meeting coming up so mm -hmm. thank you yeah hey, hey Elliot yeah Paul Dunlap just um, thinking about that Friday the 13th um, at our school the news came out in the middle of a class and students had just finished writing an essay and we just kind of looked at one another and this student who doesn't usually say a lot he said hey can we take a team photo and it felt slightly morbid but kind of wonderfully appropriate for the moment so we have a friday the 13th class photo from that class as students are dispersing and i i'm assuming he was he was prescient because there is no more school this this year right well and that that might have been um some of my doing i kind of I usually like to be right, and this is not one of those times. And I, I, when I saw our district was being a little conservative and looking to the county and having followed the county a little bit, I thought that they were gonna be um, conservative in erring in the direction of student safety. Uh, I had been passing out books that week. And so uh -huh. we were kind of ready to go. Uh, we found out via email that Friday night, March 13th, um, and students and families found out that weekend. Um, so that Monday, um, I decided I wanted to get my, the majority of my students on Google Classroom as quickly as possible because we hadn't used Google Classroom prior to that. Um, so I posted it on our, on our school's gradebook um, as an assignment with specific directions telling students how to get to Google Classroom, how to log in, how to join the class. And then after that, um, I followed up with emails and phone calls to students who hadn't joined it took several days, um, but eventually I was able to contact all students and get them all enrolled. Uh, some students, it took a week or, or longer. And when they finally connected, I heard some students saying, sorry, I've been sleeping for the past five days. Um, they just, there was so much up in the air and so much uncertainty that um, I think for a lot of students, they, they just didn't know um, what they were supposed to do. There was not a lot of guidance. Some students had uh, not been to school that Friday, so they didn't have their materials. Um, so after that, our school organized different days where students could come on campus at staggered times to be able to pick up materials, to be able to access their lockers. Um, and, and we've done a lot of work to be able to reach uh, the majority of our students now. So when, when you say we, uh, I know a few of you have mentioned like some students have had trouble getting online. We'll get back to the sleeping later, but uh, that's very interesting. Uh, but what did the, what role did the school play or the district play in helping you get everybody together and uh, make this transition? Was there extra help or were you out on your own? Anybody, Stacy, do you have a, anything to say? Our admin took care of everything. Um, they worked around the clock. They're still, the principal and vice principal go in every single day and they're there in case a student has an issue with a tech thing, they can come in and the front door is set up with tables right there. Our IT person is there every day. Um, we're also doing meal distribution, so they're helping with that too. Um, but our admin uh, followed up with every single family to get the families what they needed. For that. Um, we also launched a special fundraising drive just for this um, and there was a bigger effort because we keep in touch with our alums so it included flying alum home from their college campuses and helping with some unemployment relief for young adults who are out of jobs now. Um, so it was a pretty big school-wide effort led by that. You mentioned before that some of the students live quite a distance. There's a dormitory at Eastside Prep. So what could the school do if somebody had a problem and they live, you know, three hours away or two hours? Yeah, so there's been some overnight mailing of, of materials, um, some driving, some distance. Um, yeah, I think we were able to get the dorm students moved out Thursday evening and they had a little bit of um, lead time. So we were able to make sure that they had um, Chromebooks if they needed them. Um, and, and a few of them were able to get home internet, but our vice principal helped kind of walk their families through that process if they didn't have it already. Um, the dorms also make it really difficult to do social distancing. So even thinking about the fall is gonna be pretty interesting because about a third of our students 
choose to live on campus. So, so okay, let's go to the first day that you're, you're teaching. How did it meet your own expectations? What was it like when you first, uh, I know for some of you it was asynchronous, so you have a different experience, but how did it start feeling as you um, moved into this new reality? The, the first project or the first assignment, they did a, um, a vocabulary uh, assignment, uh, creative vocabulary assignment. It was like um, some words from the book that they were going to be using for their research project. And they needed to do something creative, but also like um, part of the prompt was like, um, use these words as best as you can to put, uh, to put a poem or a short story together about what this first week has been like. Um, and uh, that was pretty dope actually, as far as like, um, and I didn't get it back from, as far as like how it connected to COVID-19 from a lot of the kids, but the, the kids that did, it was, it was, it was pretty cool. We had a lesson where they had to record themselves saying how coronavirus changed them and, you know, and it fit perfectly and that we're, you know, we're studying the preterite and so it was perfect. And when I listened to their recordings, I wanted to cry. One, because I missed them and this, I could see them talking to me, but two, the life had been sucked out of them and um, they were so sad and it made me really, really sad. And so I couldn't wait to see them. And then, of course, you know, getting a bunch of middle schoolers on Zoom and then not being very familiar on how to use it. The first meeting, like I saw them, it was really great and I wanted to get rid of them. Like, okay, I'm not sure what I'm doing with you guys right now. I'm so glad I saw you. Adios. <laughs> right? It was quick. And, you know, since then, it's been much, much better. And I've figured out a way to be, have it be engaging because my classes are so engaging in real life. and. Um, as you know, as we all have encountered when we talk to the screen and the kids are all muted, it's you're talking to yourself. And that's not why I became a teacher. And, and so really missing that connection with the students and but trying to find ways through Zoom to make it seem like we're still together. Um, because this is their last hurrah. They're promoting in less than four weeks. I'm moving on across the street or over to East Side or wherever they're going to go next. Mm -hmm. Can you give an example of one or two of those messages back that that showed you that it was sad for them? Yeah, well, I could hear it in their voices. Um, the kids who are middle schoolers are usually pretty bubbly and they, they do anything I ask them to do. And um, they were sitting on their beds. Their voices were very monotone. Um, they talked about how they, the best part of like their lives was going to school and that's gone and not seeing their friends and, you know, um, some of them weren't, weren't leaving their homes at that time. And, um, and so those were kind of messages that I heard a lot and also losing their activities, their sports and, and having basically saying I'm at home, I'm playing video games, I'm watching Netflix and and I miss, I miss school. And so many of the students that was over, you know, football, football, soccer was like my favorite thing. And now it's gone. And their yeah. lives have been as upended yeah. as anybody's. You Absolutely. know, we think a lot about the mm -hmm. parents and of course the teachers, and, mm -hmm. but uh, wow. Yeah. So uh, I, you've all had this tiny glimpse into their rooms. Um, I'm wondering, do you have any new impressions of some of your students from the little bit that you've entered their house uh, during these classes or maybe on one-on-one -on -one talks afterwards? Paul Dunlap, you, you looked like you were nodding. Well, it, it's something I'd already been paying attention to because um, I have two high school daughters. One is a senior and one is a freshman, which parents know and that changes your thinking about students. And so seeing little glimpses into their rooms or wherever they allow us to see them is a good reminder that they're at different stages of learning how to be a social creature and they can control elements of their environment, but not all of it. Um, one student, he said, I used to think of what 
school kept me from doing, and now I miss the freedom it gave me. Because at his home, he is one tiny participant in the world that his parents create for him. Whereas at school, he got to be his full high school young man self. And so that was an interesting reminder. And the other thing is they're learning how to give themselves structure. And, they're, and there's a whole range of who has structure and who doesn't. They're all seeing that it's important, but seeing who is still in pajamas or unwashed or not even willing to open the video because as I told them today, we have to assume you're in the bathroom or you're in your panties. <laughs> Um, and then those who are able to get up and give themselves purpose. So just that reminder that as we're figuring out how to deal with this, and that this is one component of life, they at different, you know, degrees of maturity have other components to their life too. And just for us always to remember that, I think, I think it makes us teach people differently. So we try to make school the place where they can do school. We have a long school day. It's eight to five. The school's open till 10. Um, a lot of students are used to doing schoolwork at school and then doing home at home. Um, and we know that many of them live in very crowded environments. Um, so, but we, you know, just confirmed with this, I have a senior who can only do Zoom on her front stoop in her apartment complex because there's no space inside her apartment. I uh, have a student whose two siblings also go to our school and the three of them share one bedroom. So they're on the floor on different sides of the bed. Um, but the weather's nice now, so they, you know, someone can go in the backyard or they'll kind of spread out there. Um, yeah, students who are in the middle of um, their class and then like an uncle will come by and ask them to help with something. So they have to sign off right away and get to work um, or they're managing younger siblings. So they are juggling a lot, much more than I am right now. Um, many of them have lots of chores to do. They're helping to cook for the family. Um, they're helping to do DoorDash and other jobs with their families on the weekends. Um, so it's just a reminder of how much they were already juggling, but for many of them, how much school was an escape. Um, and now their lives, these different worlds are just melding and they need to try to figure out what boundaries look like and that. Um, on the plus side, some students have said that for the first time they actually get to see their parents because their parents work night shifts and they often don't get to see them during the week. So they appreciate the fact that they can have lunch together and um, our school day ends much um, earlier during this distance learning mode, so they get to spend a lot more time with their families, which they do appreciate. How are the parents reacting to that in different communities? Uh, and what, what would you want from the parents and what are you getting? Um, Paul McHenry, let's go to Mountain View. You know, all in all, the um, tone of the parent communications has changed from one of, um, kind of what can my student do to get the A to, um, hey, my kid's just basically giving up now, right? I, I um, you know, see a lot of students, especially at this time where um, they've just kind of hit a wall and it's, you know, I don't feel like doing this. I, you know, the, a lot of my one-on-one -on -one interactions with students have been like, what can I do to just even get myself motivated to do schoolwork? Um, and so kind of, you know, I just, right before our meeting responded to a parent email with, you know, your daughter's been getting an A all year. And then suddenly like for the last week and a half, she's fallen off the radar and it's, you know, I'm, I've got um, no motivation and I just, you know, am, am done. Um, so that's been a challenge that I think is unique to this situation and that, you know, I'm, I'm worried about going forward. Um, you know, the, the stuff that I've been reading on mental health in this crisis suggests that it's going to get worse rather than better um, as we continue. The parents in my school usually don't have email, and I'm actually the parent of four Palo Alto kids, so it's been an interesting contrast to be like the parent of four Palo Alto school children and a teacher in East Palo Alto, and you see just how wide that divide is on so many levels. Um, when I call parents, then they're very overwhelmed. And I will say I actually was one of those parents who got overwhelmed, <laughs> I remember. My, but when I talk to parents of my students, they, most of them are still working jobs or they're laid off and they're desperately trying to find a new job. And um, so they have a lot of financial concerns that most parents in Palo Alto do not have. They have a lot of pressures they're trying to set their kids up for school when I'll have like up to five kids in a room I've seen for some of my students sharing one space. And it's just made me realize how much I need to make my classwork 
as a communication between me and my students. And I will say I've actually seen my own children's teachers do the same thing. They've made it more and more the children running their own education. And I think in the long run, that's actually better for the kids across the board to be in charge of their own education. So can you give but, an example of how that would translate to be in charge of your own? So I have had to make um, with my students, it's mean it means I'm making tons of really short YouTube tutorials to answer like literally any question they could have. For my own children, even my second grader, now the school has set it up so she gets her Zoom schedule from her teacher and it's not me because I was, you know, doing my Zoom classroom and then I had four children's Zoom classrooms to set up. And that was really hard. And a lot of my students are from even bigger. I have students from families of nine, 10, 11 kids. And their parents are trying to do this while often working outside the home. It's just an impossible ask. You know, I love yoga, but I never had time for yoga. I'm doing yoga every day and put that on. And so some kids on their schedule put like, you know, movie time with my family. Yes, like this is important. Um, and so just teaching them how to organize. And, you know, when we meet, I'm like, we share some of these schedules to, so they can see how other kids are organizing their days. There are students that know that they can do nothing for the, for the rest of the year and they'll be fine. They'll like either have time to make it up or, or whatever, and that's fine. But those kids that, um, the students who do want to like uh, um, stay involved, stay engaged and keep learning, whether it comes from their parents or not, um, they're having to do a lot of the heavy lifting on their own. And I think that that's a really good thing to a certain extent um, because they are learning how to be um, self-reliant. Um, I think a little earlier than they, than, than they would um, otherwise. Um, well, we have many students who are doing much worse than they did before. Um, there have been a few bright spots. Um, I'm the advisor for a junior who really struggles to learn just cognitively. It's hard for him. He tries to take every tutoring opportunity he can, and he currently has the highest grades he's ever had while managing his two younger brothers and cooking for his family three to five times a week because the, the lectures are recorded. So he'll pause and he'll write down, he'll practice, he'll check his answer, he can text the teacher, and then he can replay it. And he said he's just so in the zone and he wants to be a really good example for his brothers who are working right next to him at the kitchen table. And he's just accelerating. He's doing, yeah, I get texts from his teachers all the time saying that things are clicking for him in ways that they couldn't during the school year. And also he's not with all his friends all the time in class, trying to be cool in front of them. Um, and his, he's able to reflect on that too. And so for a few of our students who are able to really embrace this new mode. I think it's a wake up call for us teachers that we can differentiate in different ways. I'm really rethinking a lot of parts of my curriculum where um, it's very teacher focused and understanding like if we put it in the hands of the students and give them structure and give them deadlines and give them support, they can really flourish in ways that we didn't understand before. That's, that's a great uh, story, a feel good story. And I I, I think all of us uh, listening just really are rooting this guy on. My students are often sad and anxious and often lonely when they, the ones who are checking in with me, some of them are like, I've got my video games, I'm good. But a lot of them are, they're feeling overwhelmed and they really miss their friends. And, um, and I see that in my own kids too, like missing the social. I hadn't realized how, I mean, I knew school was a huge social support, but I hadn't realized how critical it is for kids is like a social emotional support, even though I sort of knew it, this has just really reinforced that idea to me, how much we need school to be, how, how powerful school is as a social emotional reinforcement tool. And so it has me thinking about how to make it even more of a positive force that way when my kids go back. Another thing is um, my own 14 year old said to me, um, she said that this was changing kids because she said, um, it was something along the lines of, you know, she's a teenager and teenagers start to realize that adults don't really know what's going on. And she said, now with this, all the kids are realizing that adults really don't know what's going on. And I think we need to pay attention. Like that kind of hit me hard. I was like, wow, you're right. Teachers are famous for uh, having worked longer than a 40 hour week uh, because you're taking home 
papers to grade, your, it just seems like an endless job. Uh, we won't get into the inequity of that in terms of pay scales and stuff, but I'm actually wondering how this period of time compares with the normal stretch of hours that you put in. Uh, how has it been easier? Has it been more time consuming than before? Uh, Paul McHenry, can you start us off on that? How, how has it been comparatively? Yeah, so I actually, when we first were off, was thinking, oh, like I've got commute time that I'm now going to like learn something new or try something new. And, and that hasn't happened. Um, I probably another 20 hours a week beyond what I had worked before. And part of it is just adapting and adjusting. And I have 20 some students who have, are either special ed or have a 504 who need modifications to their work. Um, but part of it is the stuff that takes two or three minutes to do in the classroom, sometimes takes 20 or 30 minutes to do outside the classroom. So I had a student today, right, who if we were in the classroom, it would have been, I would have stopped by his desk, I would have gotten him started, I would have circled back around 10, 15 minutes later, I would have checked on his progress. And instead it was three emails back and forth and a 15 minute Zoom call to answer every possible question that could conceivably come up and work through and, and do those types of things so that he could learn. And, and I don't have a problem with doing that, right? Like that's my job. Um, but I've gotten to the point where I'm having to actually schedule in lunch times now because I've, I've looked and, you know, I've spent from 7 a.m. to like 7 or 8 at night at my computer, like doing stuff um, and getting everything ready. And so uh, the good news is right now that everything's kind of we're, we're getting on track with everything that's easing up and I'm finding myself spending less time. Um, but in terms of the, the early part, it's it's been a, a drain on on time and and energy. Julio, I see you nodding. Uh, has it changed for you? Uh, somewhat. So uh, this year I teach 1.2 FTE. So that means I have all six periods close to 200 students. Um, and so prior to our school closure, I didn't have a prep during the school day and all of my planning and grading I was doing outside of the school day. Um, now uh, with virtual teaching, uh, my classes are uh, asynchronous. So I give week long assignments. I post videos explaining the different concepts. I'm available for students during school hours to answer their questions via email or on the, the comment section in Google Classroom. Um, and so in, in the beginning, it definitely was taking me a lot longer because there was a lot of new platforms that I needed to learn, uh, figuring out how to create videos and how to post them because I'd never done that before. Um, I, on top of grading and giving feedback to all of my students, I feel like now I've been able to uh, get a, a better handle of what I'm doing and better be able to balance my time. Um, but it, it is still a significant um, just uh, part of my day to, uh, to be able to do that. Uh, again, with the majority of my time being on, on giving feedback and uh, being available to my students throughout the week because I understand that they're doing assignments at different times of the day. Um, and so it's, it almost feels like um, the, the, and it's always the case, I think, for, for, uh, for myself, but the, the boundary between my, my teaching life and my, my home life are now just one and the same. During normal times, when uh, for my Spanish class, kids come in and it's the maestra show. It's like maestra's got a show and what's happening today and what is she going to do? And, and now, you know, I have to create this new maestra online and um while we're still like the unit we're we're doing is similar to something we would do i have to redo everything yeah. now creating it for the digital platform for the class there's a huge amount of time and and unlike julio like i did used to have prep time during the day there is no prep time and you know because i'm still a mom and now i'm still in my home my family is still here. I'm also, I have my dogs and they keep me busy too. And so there's all this other 
you know, when I'm at Fletcher, I'm at Fletcher and I'm, I'm just maestra. And, but here I'm, I'm trying to still be maestra and be Margarita and mom and mom to the dogs. And it's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, wow. And, and I'm still, I'm very fortunate that my kids have their own rooms and our internet is super fast and we have a yard and in this area we can still walk and leave our homes, but it, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult and the expectation is going to be much higher come the fall and of ourselves and from our districts and our families and the, the unknown of the new normal is quite frightening. <laughs> Yikes. I, uh, I have just one last question. I hope everybody can share something about their own personal takeaway. What has this period of time done in terms of your view of your profession? Yeah, I would say that this has um, affirmed something that I had already realized that shifted in my teaching and it kind of goes to what Margarita was saying is that when non-teaching friends ask me if it gets boring doing the same thing year after year I said there are 150 new personalities there's nothing the same about it and that more than giving information or insights the most important part of my job is facilitating uh, like real-time thought-provoking interaction and I haven't found, I mean, I, I, I feel the absence of that in my life. I, I haven't found something that's comparable. That to me is what's so exciting about high school is when you set up the circumstance that people can engage with each other and an idea and you see, you see new ideas and you see discoveries and you see that enthusiasm. Um, and you know, Zoom gives a little taste of some of that, but I haven't found, I, I haven't found the actual replacement. And so I really miss that. I mean, I've got the parts of the job that I didn't sign up to teach for without the parts that were the rewarding part. Thank you. I hope you get back to that, that other uh, flip side. Uh, Stacy, how about you? Yeah, I agree with what Paul just said that the, the joy of teaching is working with students and being with students and watching their interactions. So much of it is seeing them do something where they don't even realize we see them. It's like spying on their learning and to not have that opportunity, it's, it's rough, it's really rough. Um, so it helps me appreciate all these moments that we do have for connection and to emphasize those way more than curriculum, which teaching at a college prep school is kind of unheard of. Um, so it's, it's really allowing us to kind of step back and better know what it means to teach the whole child um, when they're not in our presence and how we can care for them. Um, our vice principal just keeps reminding us that our obligation is to give them opportunities to learn. And that looks like whatever it does right now. Um, so it's allowing us to be a lot more creative. Um, it reminds me how important school is for all of our students' lives. So many students are like, I didn't realize how much I love school till I didn't have it anymore <laughs> in the same way. Um, and I think it, it raises all of our respect for these institutions that exist. Um, huge shout out, especially to Ravenswood, just seeing the huge pivot that the district did with distributing meals to anyone in the community, to getting technology out as quickly as they did and understanding what these community institutions really are. Um, I think that's been really eye-opening for a lot of us too. Thank you. Um, Paul McHenry? So I would echo what, um, what uh, Paul and Stacy had said. Um, I, I think also for me, part of it has been um, Normally, I just, I'm in my classroom, I can shut my door, I can teach, um, and just seeing how um, my colleagues and administrators at our school have handled this and how they've served as resources and what they've been able to do. Um, you know, I've been able to lean on them a little bit more. Um, I think they've leaned on me or, or um, and, and the collaboration I think that we've had has um, really been a, get a growth process, I think, for all of us. And so uh, it's been nice to be able to engage in that, even if the circumstances aren't as nice as they, they could have been. And Mary Ann, thank you, Paul. Um, a lot of it has already been said. I think it's, I've always felt like if you want kids to learn, they really have to be personally invested in it. And this just reinforces that more than ever. It also just really reinforces that like different kids learn things differently. And so to the extent that we can make it so that they direct their own learning, then we need to. 
And the other thing, it just, you know, every once in a while you see them saying, oh, computers will replace teachers. And I think this has been a really excellent experiment in why that will never happen. Because, you know, in a classroom, I have a kid who's struggling and I give them a look and they know that look says, I believe in you and they keep working. And now I can't give them the look. So I have to get really creative to find a way to send the look without being right there. So. Thank you. Uh, Manny, what about you? Um, well, um, I, I, I'd like to, oh, can you, I'd like to echo some of the stuff that Marianne had stated before, like, you know, uh, a lot of the conversations that are happening right now, and, and it's not that they haven't happened before, but I think that we're exploring these things a little more seriously, these uh, student-centered learning, truly, um, uh, uh, pertinent and relevant pedagogy for our kids, um, being truthful about, you know, the fact that, yeah, adults really don't know what the hell is going on truly um uh and everybody's trying to like you know but being more uh real as to what it is that because it, it just seems that and again it's it's based on some of the conversations that i've had with students and parents and teachers it's like um a lot of the angst and the, and the anxiety that they're going through right now is because is they feel that they don't they don't trust the people who are there, who they're supposed to be trusting and, and at every level. And so I feel that I'm hoping that on the other side of this, those conversations are, are more geared towards alleviating that angst. Thank you. And Julio, what's your takeaway on teaching? You know, something that I hope uh, comes out of this um, is what we already know the fact that our and not to uh, tap my own back or anything here but the fact that we work really hard for our students and we go above and beyond um, we are always learning and, and trying new things and new approaches new strategies to reach our students and to support them in their growth and in being successful and that I hope that translates into more support for our schools. Um, I don't know if, if people remember, but last year we had several districts across the street who went on strike. And my district as well was really close to going on strike. Our schools are underfunded. And uh, this situation just highlights even more that this work is so important and we need more support and more resources for our, our public schools. Thank you. And Margarita. I think um, one of the things that is really stuck with me from all of this is that teachers are so creative. Uh, no one taught us how to do this. This is not what we signed up for. And we took it and we pivoted and we did our best. And so many teachers across the country have been sharing on Twitter, on different Facebook groups, and some stuff is really good and stuff stuff's really bad, but so many people have been sharing and sharing and sharing. And, um, and I have really appreciated that. Um, and also just appreciated the support within my school. And I can't wait to get back in the classroom and I can't wait to the day that I can hug my students again and <laughs> give them a high five and not be freaked out. Um, but, and I know that's, that's a ways away, but I, I can't wait for that. Well, I mentioned at the outset that this, uh, as we record this on May 7th, it's part of Teacher Appreciation Week. And I just feel there's no appreciation that can come close to underscoring and, and, and saying how, how much we owe to people like you coming into the lives of, of students. And I think probably all of you had somebody like that as well, or you probably wouldn't be teachers today. But thank you so much for the work you do. And I hope that very soon you're back in your element where um, maybe you take a few things from this period of time with you, but that you're high-fiving, hugging, and you're really uh, just doing your maestra in the room.